Section 14 of Astounding Stories, 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Great Denim, by Harl Vincent, Part 3. The air whistled by them as the ship was drawn upward with ever-increasing speed. The other passengers cowered in fright as the two men rolled over and over on the floor, banging at each other indiscriminately. Both were hurt. Carl's lip was split and bleeding profusely. One eye was closing. But now he was on top, and he pummeled his opponent to a pulp. Long after he ceased resisting them, the blows continued, until the features of Leon Lemaire were unrecognizable. The infuriated Carl did not see that one of the members of the party was creeping up on him from behind. Neither was he aware that the upward motion of the arrow had ceased, and that they now hung motionless in space. A terrific blow at the base of his skull sent him sprawling. Must have been struck by a rocket, one of those funny ships that crossed the ocean so quickly. A million lights danced before his aching eyeballs. Lying prone across the inert body of his foe, Dimly conscious and fingers clutching weakly, he knew that the cabin was filled with people. Alien voices bellowed commands. There was the screaming of women, the sound of blows, curses. Then all was silence and darkness. It was a far cry to the little bookshop off Cooper Square, but Carl was calling for Rudolph when he next awoke to the realization that he was still in the land of the living. His head was bandaged and his tongue furry, a terrible hangover. Then he heard the voices, and they were discussing Peter Van Dorn. He opened one eye as an experiment. The other refused to open. But it might have been worse. At least he was alive. He could see well enough with the one good optic. "'Shh!' whispered one of the voices. "'He's recovering.' He looked solemnly into the eyes of an old man, a pair of wise and gentle eyes that reminded him somehow of Rudolph's. "'Quiet now, Peter,' said the old man. "'You'll be all right in a few minutes. "'Banged up a bit, you are, but nothing serious.' "'Don't call me Peter,' objected Carl. "'He loathed the sound of the name, "'loathed himself for his recent thoughts and actions. "'I am Carl Crasson,' he continued, "'and as such will remain until I die.' "'There were others in the room, "'and he saw glances of satisfaction pass between them. "'This was a strange situation. "'These men were not of the purple.' Neither were they of the gray. Their garments shone with the whiteness of pure silver, and that's what they were, of finely woven metallic cloth. Was he in another world? Very well, Carl. The kind old man was speaking once more. I merely want you to know that you are among friends, your father's friends. Surprised into complete wakefulness, Carl struggled to a seated position and surveyed the group that faced him. They were a fine-looking lot, mostly older men, but there was a refreshing wholesomeness about them. "'My father?' he faltered. "'He's not alive.' "'No, my poor boy. Derek Van Dorn left this life at the hands of your uncle, Tsar Boris. But we, his friends, are here to avenge him, and to restore you to his throne.' "'But—but—I still do not understand.' "'Of course not, because we've kept ourselves hidden from the world for more than twenty-two years, waiting for this very moment. There are forty-one of us, including Rudolph, my brother. We have lived in the jungle since Boris conquered the Eastern Hemisphere, but amongst our numbers were several scientists, two greater than was Boris, even in his heyday. They have done wonderful things, and we are now prepared to take back what was taken from Derek, and more. His life we cannot restore, heaven rest him. But his kingdom we can, and to his son it shall be returned. And he has cared for you well. We watched, you know, in the detectoscopes, long-range radio vision mechanisms that can penetrate solid walls, the earth itself, to bring us the images and voices of persons who may be on the other side of the world. We've followed your every move, my boy, and the first time we feared for you was yesterday, when the drug of the Tsar's physician stole away your sense of right and wrong. But we were in time to save you, and now we are ready to kneel at your feet and proclaim you our king. First there is the Tsar to be dealt with, and then we shall set up the new regime. Are you with us? Carl gazed at the speaker in wonder. He, a king? Always to live amongst the wearers of the purple? To be responsible for the welfare of half the world? It was unthinkable. But Tsar Boris, the murderer of his own father, he must be punished, and at the hands of the sun. "'I'll do it,' he said simply. "'That is, I'll do whatever you have planned in the way of exterminating the Tsar. "'Then we'll talk of the new empire.' 
But how is the Tsar to be overcome? I thought he was invincible with his moon men and terrible weapons. Ah, that, my boy, is where our scientists have triumphed. True, his rays were terrible. They could not be combated when he first returned. The strange chemicals and gases of the moon men defied analysis or duplication. His citadel atop the city of Dorne is proof against them all, proof against the explosives and rays of all kinds known to him. The disintegration and decomposition rays have no effect on the crystal of its walls. It is hermetically sealed from the outer air, so cannot be gassed. The vibration impulses have no effect upon its reinforced structure, but there is a ray, a powerful destructive agent, against which it is not proof, and our scientists have developed this agency. You shall have the privilege of pressing the release of the energy that destroys the arch-fiend in his lair. His dominance over. The Empire will fall. We shall take it. For you. A strange exultation shone from the faces of those in the room, and Karl found that it was contagious. His bosom swelled, and he itched to handle the controls of this wonderful ray. This ray, continued the brother of old Rudolf, carries the longest vibrations ever measured, the vibrations of infrared, the heat ray. We have succeeded in concentrating a terrific amount of power in its production, and with it are able to produce temperatures in excess of that of the interior of the earth, where all substances are molten or gaseous. The Tsar's crystal palace cannot withstand it for a second. He cannot escape. How will you know he's there at the time? Carl was greatly excited, but he was curious, too. Come with me, my boy. I'll show you. The old man led him from the room, and others followed respectfully. They stopped at a circular port, and Carl saw that they were high above the earth in a vessel that hovered motionless, quivering with what seemed like human eagerness to be off. This vessel, he asked, it's a huge sphere, the base of our operations. To it we drew the arrow on which you were fighting. A magnetic force discovered by our scientists, and differing only slightly from that used in counteracting gravity. We let the rest of them go. Foolishly, I think. But it's done now, and we have no fear. From this larger vessel we shall send forth smaller ones, armed with the heat ray. The flagship of the fleet is to be yours, and you'll lead the attack on Dorn. Here, I'll show you the Tsar. They have reached the room of the detectoscopes a mass of mechanisms that reminded Carl of nothing so much as the vitals of the intermediate levels which he had visited with Leon and Rhoda. He knew that he flushed when he thought of her. What a fool he had been! A disk glowed as one of the silver-robed strangers manipulated the controls. The upper surface of Dorn swung into view. Rapidly the image drew nearer, and they were looking at the crystal pyramid that was the Tsar's palace. Down, down to its very tip they passed. Carl recoiled from the image as it seemed they were falling to its glistening sides. The sensation passed. They were through, penetrating solid crystal, masonry, steel, and duralumin girders. Room after room was opened to their view. It was magic, the magic of the upper levels. Now they were in the throne room. A group of purple-clad men and women stood before the dais. Leon, Rhoda, all of his wild companions were there facing the dais. The Tsar was raging, and the words of his speech came raucously to their ears through the sound-producing mechanism. "'You failed miserably, all of you!' he screamed. "'He's gotten away, and you know the penalty. Taru, the vibrating ray!' The moon man already was fussing with a gleaming machine, a machine with bristling appendages, having metallic spheres on their ends, a machine in which dozens of vacuum tubes glowed suddenly. Rhoda screamed. It was a familiar sound to Carl. He noted with satisfaction that Leon could hardly stand on his feet, and that his face was covered with plasters. Then, startled, he saw that Leon was shivering as with the ague. His outline on the screen grew dim and indistinct as the rate of vibration increased. Then the body bloated and became misty. He could see through it, the vibrating death. His father had gone the same way. Carl groaned at the thought. The whine of the distant machine rose in pitch until it passed the limit of audibility. Tiny pinpoints of incandescence glowed here and there from the Tsar's victims, as periods of vibration were reached that coincided with the natural periods of certain of the molecules of their structure. They were no longer recognizable as human beings. Shimmering auras surrounded them. Suddenly they were torches of cold fire, weaving, oscillating, 
with inconceivable rapidity. Then they were gone, vanished utterly. The Tsar laughed, that horrible cackle again. "'Great God!' exclaimed Karl. "'Let's go. The fiend must not live a moment longer than necessary. Are you ready?' Rudolph's brother smiled. "'We're ready, Karl,' he said. The great vessel hummed with activity. The five torpedo-shaped arrows of the battle fleet were ready to take off from the cavities in the hull. In the flagship, Karl was stationed at the control of the heat ray. His instructions in its operation had been simple. A telescopic sight with crosshairs for the centering of the object to be attacked. A small lever. That was all. He burned with impatience. Then they were dropping, falling clear of the mother ship. The pilot pressed a button and the electronic motors started. A burst of roaring energy streamed from the tapered stern of their vessel, and the earth lurched violently to meet them. Down, down they dived until the rocking surface of Dorn was just beneath them. Then they flattened out and circled the vast upper surface. From the corner of his eye Carl saw that the other four vessels of his fleet were just behind. There was a flurry among the wasp-like clouds of pleasure craft over the city. They scurried for cover. Something was amiss. "'Hurry!' shouted Carl. "'The warning is out. There is no time to lose.' He pressed his face to the eyepiece of his sight, his finger on the release lever of the ray. The crystal pyramid crossed his view and was gone. Again it crossed, more slowly this time, and now his sight was dead on it, the gleaming wall rushing toward him. Pressure on the tiny button. They'd crash into the palace in another second. But no. A brilliant flash obscured his vision, a blinding light that made the sun seem dark by comparison. They roared on and upward. He took his eye from the telescope and stared ahead, down. The city was dropping away, and where the crystal palace had stood, there was a spreading blob of molten material from which searing vapors were drifting. The roofs of the city were sagging all around, and the great streams of the sparkling, sputtering liquid dripped into the openings that suddenly appeared. Derek Van Dorn was avenged. "'Destroy! Destroy!' yelled Carl madly. A microphone hung before him, and his words rang through every vessel of his convoy. The lust of battle was upon him. A fleet of the Tsar's arrows had risen from below, twenty of them at least. These would be manned by moon creatures, he knew, and would carry all of the dreadful weapons which had originated on that strange body, but he did not know that his own ships were insulated against most of the rays used by the Tsar's forces. He knew only that he must fight, fight and kill, exterminate every last one of the Tsar's adherents, or be exterminated in the attempt. Kill! Kill! The madness was contagious. His pilot was a marvel and drove his ship straight for the massed ships of the foe. The air was vivid with light streamers. A ray from an enemy vessel struck the thick glass of the port through which he looked, and the outer surface was shattered and pockmarked, but a cloud of vapor and a dripping stream of fiery liquid told him his own ray had taken effect on a vessel of the enemy. One. They wheeled about and spiraled, coming up under another of the Tsar's arrows. It vanished in a puff of steam, and they narrowly missed being covered by the falling remnants of incandescent liquid. Two. Carl's aim was good, and he gloated in the fact. Three. They climbed and turned over, dropping again into the fray. Four. The air grew stifling, for the expended energy of the enemy's rays must needs be absorbed. It could not disintegrate them nor decompose their bodies, but the contacts were many, and the liberation of heat enormous. They were suffocating. But Carl would not desist. They drove on, now beneath, now above an enemy ship. He lost count. One of his own vessels was in trouble. The report came to him from the little speaker at his ear. He looked around in alarm. A glowing object reeled uncertainly over there between two of the arrows of the Tsar. The concentration of beams and vibrations was too much for the sturdy craft. It was red-hot, and its occupants burned alive where they sat. Suddenly it slipped into a spin and went slithering down into the city, leaving a gaping opening where it fell. This sobered him somewhat. But he went on into battle with renewed fury. How many had they brought down? Fifteen? Sixteen? He tore his purple jacket from his body. The perspiration rolled from his pores. His own ship would be next. But what did it matter? Kill! Kill! He shouted once more into the microphone, then dived into battle. Another and another. In heaven's name, how many were there? It was maddening. If only he could breathe. His lungs were seared, his eyes smarting from the heat and then it was over. 
Three of the Tsar's arrows remained, and these turned tail to run for it. No, they were falling, nose down, under full power, diving into the city from which they had come. Suicide? Yes. They couldn't face the recriminations that must come to them, and anything was better than facing that burning death from the strange little fighters which had come out from the skies. Dorn was a mass of wreckage. Carl tore at the fastenings of the ports, searing his fingers on the heated metal. His pilot had collapsed, the little arrow heading madly skyward with no guiding hand. Air! They must have air! He loosened the pilot's jacket, slapped frantically at his wrists in the effort to bring him to consciousness. Then he was at the controls of the vessel, tugging on first one, then the other. The arrow circled and spun, executing the most dangerous of side-slips and dives. A little voice was speaking to him, the voice of the radio, instructing him. In a daze, he followed instructions as best he could. The whirlings of the earth stabilized after a time, and he found he was flying the vessel, climbing rapidly. A sense of power came to him as the little voice of the radio continued to instruct. Here were the controls of the electronic motor, there the gravity energy. He was proceeding in the wrong direction, but what did it matter? He learned the meaning of the tiny figures of the altimeter, the difference between the points of the compass. Still, he drove on. "'East! Turn east!' begged the little voice from the radio. "'You're heading west. Your speed, a thousand kilometers an hour. It's too fast. Turn back, Tsar Peter!' He tore the loudspeaker of the radio from its fastenings. "'West! He wanted to go west. On and on he sped, becoming more and more familiar with the workings of the little vessel as he progressed. A cooling breeze whistled from the opened ports, a breeze that smelled of the sea. His heart sang with the wonder of it all. He could fly, and fly he did. Tsar Peter? Never. He knew now where he belonged, knew what he wanted. He'd find the coast of North America, follow it until he located New York. A landing would be easy, for had not the voice instructed him in the use of the gravity energy? He'd make his way to the lower levels, to the little bookshop of Rudolf Crassen. A suit of gray denim awaited him there, and he'd never discard it. Onward he sped into the night, which was falling fast. He held to his westward course like a veteran of the air lanes. The pilot had ceased to breathe, and Carl was sorry. Game little devil, that pilot. Have to shove his body overboard. Too bad. Rudolph's brother would understand. He'd be watching in the detectoscope. And others, those who had wished to seat him on a throne, they'd understand, too. They'd have to. Rudolph would have forgiven him, he knew. Paul Van Dorn, his own cousin, the secret agents of the Tsar, would never locate him. Too many friends of Rudolph's were of the Red Police. He gave himself over to happy thoughts, as the little arrow sped on in the darkness. Home. He was going home, back to the gray denim, where he belonged, and where now he would remain content. End of Part 3 and End of Grey Denim by Harl Vincent